Hey everybody, it's Ben here, and today we're going to build a portable solar charged power supply in an ammo can. So the project we're going to be building today, uh, some people call it a solar generator, which is a terrible term. Uh, if you catch me using that, it's only because it's a, a term other people have used and uh, seems to have caught on for whatever reason. But the whole idea is we're actually going to use a battery. Uh, we're going to charge it with a solar panel. We're going to use a solar charge controller to make sure it doesn't get overcharged or over discharged. And then we're going to add a couple of different uh, power outputs from that setup so we could power things like lights or maybe a uh, small inverter to get AC power from our DC power source. And we're going to mount them all inside of an ammo can. Uh, this is a plastic 50 caliber ammo can. You can buy these for about $10. Uh, they're nice because they've got a good sturdy handle on the top, so that definitely adds to the portability. And they already have a nice uh, gasket on the inside here, so it's waterproof, uh, weather tight. Uh, so this is the sort of thing that's kind of handy for something like camping or even uh, uh, basic emergencies, emergency preparedness, like just having a power outage at your house. So what we'll do is I'll show you what parts we're using and then how to put them together. So let's start with the battery. Right here we have a very basic 15 amp hour, 12 volt battery. It's a SLA, a sealed lead acid battery. Now what I happen to like about this one is it's the exact right size to go inside the ammo can sideways. So just for example, if I open it up with the battery turned this direction, it literally drops right in with no room on either side. Uh, it actually friction fits right in there. So with uh, hot glue, some double-sided tape, uh, industrial Velcro, it'll stay perfectly in place. The other thing I'm going to do here is I'm gonna make sure it's right in the middle of the ammo can. That way, when this is closed up and I wanna carry it around, it's in balance. It's not tipped way to one side or the other. Even here, you can see it's not even moving around at all. Uh, 15 amp hour is also uh, a good size battery in that it's small enough that it doesn't weigh too much. This whole thing altogether is going to be under 10 pounds. I want to be able to keep it portable. Uh, but it's a big enough of a battery uh, that you can get some useful energy out of it for uh, like running lights overnight, for example. It'll provide enough power for us. So for some of the other key components here, we're going to need a solar charge controller. This is a 20 amp solar charge controller. What this does is it goes between the solar panel and the battery, and that prevents the battery from being overcharged by the solar. It also has connections on here for an output, so it acts as a load controller or a low voltage disconnect. If we plugged, for example, a light bulb straight into that battery, we could drain that battery down low enough to the point that we would actually permanently damage it or shorten its life. Uh, with the control that's on here, we can set a load, like a light or whatever else it happens to be, to stop, to disconnect, to protect the battery. So the solar charge controller is going to do both of those. Another item we're going to use is the 4-in-1 charger socket panel. Uh, this is kind of a nice little device here. Uh, it has multiple connections on here, but they're all based on the size of a 12-volt cigarette lighter plug. Uh, and because of that, the components are interchangeable, so you can move them around from one spot to another on this panel. Uh, just for example, here's our 12-volt cigarette lighter plug. I can pull it out, I can move it around, I can put it in other positions. This has, besides the cigarette lighter style plug, it also has a dual USB port, and those are 2.1 amp USBs, so uh, nice and beefy. Those will run like a, a charging an iPad, for example. Uh, there's also a small voltmeter down here that's illuminated, and it has a rocker switch. So we can use that switch to turn on and off our 12-volt cigarette lighter plug and our USB connections here. So besides the main components, we're also going to need some things like a main fuse, for example. Uh, here we're just going to use a 20-amp fuse. This is an automotive style. Now, it's really because the charge controller is rated at 20 amps, we want to make sure to use everything else at 20 amps too, including the wiring, which means primarily we'll be using 12 gauge for the wiring here. Uh, to go with that, we're also going to need uh, some ring terminals and some crimp-on quarter-inch spade terminals. 
Beyond that, uh, we're going to use a pair of banana jacks. Uh, banana jacks are kind of nice because they have a plug that'll go right into them, but if you unscrew them far enough, there's also a hole and you can put bare wires right through there. So it's kind of a, a versatile connection. And we're gonna use two of these, one for our solar power in and one as an auxiliary 12 volt out. We'll also need, uh, for example, some wire nuts, some things like that. Uh, these I kind of like, these are a special type of a connector. It's a lever lock. Uh, called a WAGO, W-A-G-O, and this actually takes the place of a wire nut. They're good for up to 20 amps and that uh, 12 gauge wiring. Uh, but what's kind of neat about them is they're reusable, they hold very solidly, and in this case, uh, this particular one can take up to five conductors. So it's really nice for prototyping, very quickly uh, putting work together, or uh, cases where you wanna add one more wire where maybe you forgot how many you actually needed. You don't need to untwist a wire nut, you know, um, unspiral everything. Uh, pretty cool little connectors. I like these Wago uh, lever locks. These are pretty nice. So for our wiring on this project, we're going to use 12 gauge wiring for up to 20 amps. This is red, it is stranded. Convention says that we use red wires on the positive and black wires on the negative. That's sort of the tradition for DC. Now keep in mind there are other wiring conventions as well. So if you have a regular light bulb on AC circuitry instead of DC, in that case, the black wire is the hot and the white wire is the neutral. So uh, if we're doing anything, for example, using a component traditionally used with AC circuitry, with DC circuitry, we do wanna keep those colors in mind. This right here is a 12 volt DC light bulb. It's an LED bulb. Uh, this is about uh, 10 watts or uh, roughly a little bit less than an amp. It's rated at 860 milliamps and 800 lumens. So it's really, uh, it's the same brightness as a traditional light bulb. And it has that traditional light bulb base. So what we'll do later in this project is we will wire this connection here up for DC. So we'll have a 12 volt bulb. So it runs right off the battery. We don't need to do any conversion to AC, for example. Now on that topic, uh, this is a 100 watt power inverter. It just plugs right into a cigarette lighter style plug. Um, it's very small, very portable. Uh, it's uh, under $20. It also has a single USB connection on here and a single 120 volt AC style outlet on it. So if we wanna get AC power out of this project, instead of building a big heavy duty uh, AC inverter inside, may as well just use this nice portable little unit and just have it plug right in. Now this project is not entirely original. Lots of people have done some sort of a variation on this. Now, one way that a lot of people have done these is they actually put the ports and connections and switches on the outside of the box. What they'll do is they'll just drill a hole right through the side with something like a spade bit, and then they can mount those connections directly through the box. Now, I'm thinking that might not be the best choice because we've got this nice, durable, waterproof case, and why drill a hole in something that's already nice and waterproof? Um, also, I kind of like the look of this case just the way it is. Uh, it's kind of a covert, you know, I could stash it right with my other stuff. You don't even know what it is. Um, and furthermore, you know, some of those projects with a lot of buttons and switches on the outside, I just don't think they actually look very good. Uh, so what we'll do instead is we're going to mount all of these components inside the box. So to do that, we'll put the battery in there and then we'll make a plate that goes over the top of it. That way everything's easily accessible when you open up the box, but when you close it, everything's out of the way, looks nice and clean. So if we wanna make some sort of a cover for this, first thing we'll have to do is make some measurements. I love using, oh, hang on. This is a metal ruler, I'm not gonna use that because we could accidentally short circuit uh, the terminals are in our battery. Keep in mind that batteries are basically always on. Now this did come with a little piece of plastic uh, over the positive terminal, but just to make us feel a little bit safer, we can always take a little bit of electrical tape and cover up that negative terminal just so we can't accidentally short circuit it. 
Uh, even then, you're always better off using plastic and non-conductive items around our batteries. So using my ruler here, I'm going to measure this, and I find that we get about 6 inches by about 8 inches. And that's for the battery and just the one side. We're going to keep the other side open as a storage space. That way we can keep with us our light bulb, our AC power inverter, and if we want to get fancy, we can even remember to bring some spare fuses with us. So what we could do next then is uh, just draw out a six inch by eight inch rectangle and lay out our components. So uh, the charge controller is going to go on top. I'd probably put it right about here or so. Um, and then I'm going to put our little quad panel somewhere filling up some of the rest of the space. Now this is thick. Remember, it's got all these components sticking out the back, and that's the reason why we wanted to leave some space over here so we have this depth to work with. Um, but we don't have depth to work with right where the battery is, so we'll mount the solar charge controller essentially right over the top of the battery. And in fact, what I could do, just take out the battery, set it right here, mark it, and now I'll know exactly where the battery goes. And then the solar charge controller is going to go over the top of that. Now with our little panel, what we want to do is just remove all of these little components. And those are just held on by a ring. So we just unscrew it. Pop out the components and lay it down on our paper template right here. Likewise, I want to put on a pair of these banana jacks, but they also, those aren't going to stand up very well, so I already took one apart just to get the little flat plate off the bottom, and then I can set that down here. So now what I can do is I can just trace out my items. So I'll center the charge controller, I'll just trace it, and of course the most important part is marking where the screw or bolt holes will go to mount the component down. So I'll need to mark those. And now we know where the solar charge controller goes. Likewise, I'll trace out our quad plate here. These are inch and one eighth holes that can be drilled with a spade bit. And I'm going to mark down these little holes here too. And the banana jack. And I'm actually going to use two banana jacks, remember. So I'm just going to move the plate over and copy a second one. So now if we take our components off, we kind of have a, a template here that we can use with our box. Now one other thing we don't want to forget about is the fact that on the solar charge controller, all the power connections are actually on this side and if it's mounted on top, but most of the wiring here is underneath, we need a hole somewhere around in here for the wiring to go down through this panel. So we'll just draw in kind of a little slot right here uh, for the wiring to go through. And we more or less have a paper template of what we need to make. Now instead of just paper, we could also use something like cardboard. So here's a cardboard template I already made up. And what's nice is it's stiffer, so we could actually mount some of the components in here. So for example, I could put those banana jacks right on there, and I could even take our quad power panel, put that on here, and start putting some components through and just see how they all line up. And then, since I have my working template, I could actually test it with the box. So we've got our battery, we've got our template, this fits right over the top, and what I'm going to check for now is just to make sure that we have the clearance for some of these deeper parts to poke through. 
I want to make sure that we've got room around the battery for the wiring right here to go through from the solar charge controller. And I'll actually do a full mock-up. I'll actually mount all of this up in the cardboard just to test it out. And just one last thing to keep in mind for templates is I do need to know how big to drill these holes. I have to know what, what uh, nuts or bolts I'm going to use, what kind of hardware I'm going to use to mount these components down. And one nice easy way of doing that uh, is with a drill gauge. Um, if you have your hardware already, you can just take that and see what hole it'll line up through, match it to the right size hole, and then I can then compare that to what drill bits I happen to have. Uh, sometimes, if you don't have exactly what you're looking for, you just need to go one size bigger. So it looks like in this case, uh, 3 sixteenths will work pretty nice. And this is a 832 machine screw. And if I double check it here, it seems to fit really nice in there. Uh, in the United States, we're still using kind of a funky measurement system compared to metric, but it's what we use, and oddly enough, uh, anything in metric still seems to cost three times as much as at the hardware store. Uh, I also checked this against some of the other components like the banana jacks and that 3 16 hole will work there as well. I'll use a little bit smaller hole and 632 hardware to mount the, the solar charge controller. So now that I have my paper template, what I can do is just uh, tape it down to a piece of, for example, thin plywood, drill all the holes, cut it out, and I'll have my finished piece of material. That'll be the panel to go inside the box here. And that's how I would normally do it. But I was thinking about this, and this will be a cool little project. I might have some friends who would be interested in having one of these, or you know, maybe I'd, I'd kind of want to make it into like a kit and be able to sell it. Uh, but the whole idea of being able to make more than one and do it easily, so I thought instead of doing this by hand, what would be neat is to laser cut this plate. Now, I don't have a laser cutter, but at home I do have a Cameo Silhouette Cutter. It's a vinyl cutter or a paper cutter uh, that uses vector software. So what I did is I actually scanned the various components into the computer, again, just making sure they're kind of broken down to just the flat parts, bring them in, uh, and then manipulate them in some vector editing software. That way I was able to just perfectly uh, trace out the holes, uh, make sure they're located exactly where they need to be, uh, similar to what I did here, only doing it all electronically or digitally instead of by hand with pencil and paper. And then what I did was I exported that file to my Cameo Silhouette Cutter and I cut out a piece of cardstock. So now I have a piece of cardstock, which is it's absolutely perfect. It's, it's hand manufactured. And again, I tested it to make sure it, it did line up the way it's supposed to with my various components and fit it in the box. Fits perfect. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. And what's great about this is the fact that essentially the cutter file for this is almost exactly the same as the cut file for a laser cutter. So now I can take the file for this over, go visit my buddies at Brown Dog Gadgets, use their laser cutter, and make a piece like this, only instead of out of cardstock, make it out of either acrylic or some nice thin wood, and have a perfect plate for our box here. So I headed on over to use the laser cutter, and the first thing we did was make a test piece, just using some very plain corrugated cardboard. And probably a good thing we did, too, because uh, I had added some text, but we forgot to uh, make the difference in power between the text and the cutting, so all the text just got plain cut out instead. So that right there is a very good reason to use uh, some paper templates or mess around with a little cheap cardboard. Uh, after we corrected for the power, uh, then we put in uh, some thin, this is a 1 8 inch thick plywood, which cuts great, it looks super nice, and it can also be etched for adding any kind of text. and this wood cutout turned out really nice. Now we also experimented with some black acrylic. Here you can see it's covered with a paper backer to prevent the cut parts from getting kind of smeared and smudged from the heat. 
Here we're peeling off the paper backer, but what I found was that the black acrylic doesn't look as good as I had hoped because it's hard to read the writing, and also uh, black acrylic can be somewhat brittle, so we're going to go with the wood cover plate for this project. So now what we'll do is we'll mount all our components down to our laser cut wood panel, and then after that we'll start doing the wiring on the back of it. So we need to physically mount our components to our panel. Now, I will say uh, we're not going to mount the solar charge controller right away. And the reason why is because if it's mounted down, it's actually going to be kind of difficult to get the wires up through the panel and then into the end here. If we actually leave this loose, it's easier to put the wires through, make the connections, and then bolt it down. So we'll just set this off to the side for the moment, but we will be using uh, 632 hardware. Um, of course, this is metric and I'm mostly dealing with imperial units here. These are the nuts and bolts I've got to work with. So we'll just use the uh, English equivalent. Over here, we're going to be using 832 screws to hold the quad in place. And this is not going to be that exciting, so uh, you'll probably watch all of this as a time lapse. But basically, we just need some little screws to go through the corners. Uh, just to hold this plate in place. And if we really wanted, we could even have skipped that. Um, we could have not cut these holes because the components that go through here actually have a really big ring on the back and that would hold things on there. But the reason why I am putting these machine screws through here is that that just holds this nicely in place for me while I am working on installing those. So now this piece isn't going to move anywhere. It's not going to fall off while I install the other components. And you'll see that it's also nicely lined up with the holes. Laser cutting is our friend. So at this point, all I need to do is just make sure that I um, arrange these components in the order that I want. So for example, this has the little rubber cover um, that comes up. So I'm going to put that at the top so that when it flips up, it's not in the way like it would be if it were here. Just make sure it's straight. Up on top, we have that rubber flap. There's a little notch for it to go in. And then this really just has to be tightened finger tight. Same with the rest of them. So now we're going to install the banana jacks. You do have to keep in mind that there's sort of a, a, a backer plate that goes with it. So basically, uh, this just squeezes right around our material here. So we'll put this in from the outside. We'll do red side up. Then put that on there. Washers, nuts, and tighten it down. This is metric, so I'm going to tighten it down with a 8 millimeter socket. I'm just going to snug it, and then that way I can make sure it lines up nice and straight, because I did make these holes just a little bit bigger than they needed to be, just to give me a little bit of tolerance. Before we get started, we want to do a little planning on how we're going to do our wiring. Again, if we look at the solar charge controller is kind of the heart of all this. It's rated for 20 amps, so we're going to want to use 12 gauge wire. I got 12 gauge stranded both red and black for our positive and negative. And then on the charge controller, there's six uh, terminals on here, screw down terminals. Two for our solar panel in, so that's going to be from our solar in marked banana jacks. We've got two marked battery, so of course that's going to the battery. And then we have two that are marked with a light bulb symbol, so that's the loads. That's going to be our 12 volt DC out banana jack, and then also everything right here. And on our little quad panel, we're actually going to want to wire it up so that uh, everything is turned on and off by that switch right there that's part of it. 
Now another thing to keep in mind right away is we want to have a main fuse. Typically you do your fusing on the positive connection of the battery and it's pretty much always the first thing right away. So I have this fuse holder here. It's got 12 gauge wire on it. I've got a 20 amp fuse in there. And I thought, let's just uh, crimp a terminal right to the end of this and that will slide onto the battery. And then the other end is going to go into the positive on our solar charge controller. So what we're going to be working with is crimp on connections. Uh, super easy to work with. You don't need to know any soldering or anything like that. Basically, all you have to do is just strip a little bit off the end of our wire here. And then take one of our terminals, slide it on, and then crimp it down. So now you've got a nice simple connection there and what I can do is I can slide this right onto the spade connector that's on the battery. Now one problem with this though is that uh, the terminal, the connection here right on the battery is still exposed so it might be a good idea to actually take a little bit of heat shrink, cut a short piece of it put it on here and heat shrink it in place. That way we can't have an accidental short circuit. Now, as it is right now, we already have a piece of electrical tape over the negative, so not really a big deal. So I've got a nice uh, shrink wrapped end on there now. And then just keep in mind that this has to go from the battery positive and it's going to go up and through our panel to the solar charge controller. For our solar input, what I need to do is have a ring terminal go right onto here on the back, and then the wire has to come up through the slot to the solar charge controller. So I don't need that much length of wire on that one. Strip the end of my wire here, put on my terminal, crimp it in place. And I just need to make sure I've got enough wire to get up to the solar charge controller. I think about that much looks good. Now this is the red wire, so I want to make sure to put it onto the red connection. So again, just like with the red, we're going to strip a bit off the end of the wire, put on our ring terminal, and then crimp that down into place. And we're going to put it on the banana jack here, add the washers and nut and tighten down that nut. So now we've got our two wires from the banana jack marked solar in and that's going to come up to the solar on the solar charge controller. So far this wiring is pretty simple. We've just got the red and black wires going down to the red and the black on the banana jack here. And we added a connector to a fuse. So that's going to the battery and the other end is going to go to the battery in on the solar charge controller. We're also going to need to add a black wire from the battery connection on the charge controller to the negative of the battery itself. Now the wiring for our little quad display over here and the 12 volt out gets just a little bit more complicated because we need all of those things connected to the load output over here on the solar charge controller. So what we're going to do is basically run uh, a pair of wires out from the, the load connection, run them down through here to the back, and then we're going to run everything to it using one of these 
Wago lever nuts. This replaces a wire nut. And the other neat thing about these is uh, this one has five connections on it. They're spring-loaded, they're reusable, and uh, they're pretty handy. I like working with them. So what we're going to do is put, put our connections, spade terminals here, ring terminals here, and then we're just going to bring all the appropriate wires uh, to a pigtail and join them together with one of these. I just got done doing the majority of the wiring on this and as you can see I just have this held in place temporarily with two screws just so it stays on the panel but all the important stuff is on the back. So what you're looking at here is all I did was I cut a number of black wires. I put a spade terminal crimped on the end and then I connected all of the black wires together. And then these are also connected with a black wire that goes back to the solar charge controller. And that's this one I haven't hooked up yet. And that's going to go to the load connection, uh, the very bottom terminal on here. And then the same idea with all of the red wires. Now in this case, I've got the red wire coming from the charge controller over to here, which is our 12 volt um, kind of our secondary output, and it's just daisy-chained back to our switch. So that way, uh, power to the 12-volt DC out is always on, but everything that's connected to the switch gets turned on and off with the switch. There's actually three connectors on here. So you can see the three spade terminals. The bottommost one is a brass colored, and so that has the black ground wire going to it. The middle one has the power in to it, and the top one has our switched power out. So our switched power out is just going to a wire nut, and then it's going to the positive of the other three connectors that are on here. So pretty straightforward. Power comes into the switch, and then it goes out from the switch to the cigarette lighter plug, the USB, and the voltmeter. So I'll turn those on and off with that switch, but our 12 volt out will always be available. That'll always be on. Now, it might look like I've got a little bit too much wire here. Now, I did that on purpose. Uh, frankly, that just makes it easier to wire everything up. Uh, whenever you're working with any kind of wire nut, you always want to make sure to give yourself enough cable to to handle it and work with it. Uh, there is another way of doing this. For example, since just all the 12 volt ground is connected together, you could do something like a little uh, daisy chain, kind of crimp one to the next to the next to the next. In general, I don't like doing this because uh, it's typically hard to get a really good connection, get both wires into the same terminal, crimp it, and, and do it well, have, um, you know, get the right strip distance on the insulation and really make a good connection. Um, but that's, a, that's another way that you certainly could do it. So just to show you more, more than one way to skin a cat on that. I do like uh, this style of wire nut because um, just flipping one little lever, you can pull out a wire, you can move it, you can replace it, uh, you can add a wire. Works pretty nice. So of course over here are red and black wires with the spade terminals on the ends. Those go to the battery, of course, with the positive going through a fuse right there. Now, I already have the wires uh, connected up for, um, to the battery, and then the ones for the solar panel are going to our ring terminals on the banana jacks for the solar in, which you can see right here. So now what I'm going to do is I will unhook this again from our, our faceplate cut and strip the wires to go right into here and connect them in. So now that all my wires are connected to the solar charge controller, the solar panel, the battery, and the loads, uh, now I'm going to mount this down. 
Uh, the reason why I didn't mount it down already is if it's in place, it's actually very difficult to get these wires up through the hole and then in there. It's a lot easier if you uh, have some room to work with. But now that they're in place, what I can do is I can uh, add some screws here. This is going to be 632 hardware. And just line up the holes, slide those screws through, add a washer and a nut, and I'll do that for all four holes. So that's it in terms of uh, the wiring on our cover plate. Uh, the solar charge controller is mounted down, all the other components are mounted down. Um, we've got our little nuts and bolts holding everything together. All of our connections are snugged down. I've got some heat shrink over the positive connections of all the spades. Uh, now really all we have to do is just uh, plug it into the battery. So let's take this, let's set it down into the box, plug it into the battery and test it. So with our battery in the box here, we'll bring in our panel. Now one thing right away you might notice the spacing on the battery terminals versus these screws here. These are narrower. They will fit uh, between and they cannot short circuit uh, the battery terminals. Plus the actual material of this cover is plastic, which is non-conductive. If it makes you feel more comfortable, you could always put a couple little pieces of electrical tape under there. I think the other thing I'm going to do is actually just put a spacer in here, which will just uh, prop up the cover uh, about the thickness of these spade connections. So what I'm going to do is just set this down in here and connect up the negative and the positive terminals, keeping in mind that fuse has to be over in the empty space where all our wiring is going to go. And so I just want to gently push over all our wiring, make sure it all ends up down in that hole. And we've got power on our display showing us 12.7 volts right now. Uh, this is off, but if I flip it on, we get a nice little power indicator light. We're showing 12.7 volt uh, 12 volts over here. And of course, we have our power connections. Again, our 12 volt out is non-switched, but our USB right here and our 12 volt cigarette lighter plug here are switched based on that power right there. Now to finish up our project, I really need some way to mount down this panel, uh, keep it from moving around. The other thing is we never mounted the battery, not properly. Uh, I do love this box with this 15 amp hour battery because the battery literally sets right in there just perfect like you wouldn't believe. Now, of course, there's different ways that we could mount that battery down, some sort of a clamp or maybe uh, drill a hole in the side of the box and use a angle bracket, something like that. We could take a, a scrap of wood, we could cut it so that it, it takes up the space on either side of the battery to keep it from sliding around. A lot of different ways we could do it, but because the battery fits so well in there, all I'm going to do is just use a little bit of 100% silicone glue or caulk, um, just a little dab on the bottom of the battery and either side, and because it's going to have enough surface area, that battery is going to be rock solid. It is not going to move anywhere, and just a little dab will do ya. And then besides that, what we'll do to mount our panel in here Again, uh, you know, I could drill holes through the sides of the box and mount some angle brackets, things like that. But one of my goals of this project was to essentially leave the ammo can alone, uh, make use of its waterproof and, and, you know, that it's weather tight, it's durable, and I didn't want to be drilling holes in it. So what I'll do instead is I'm going to use an industrial Velcro. And because the battery is going to be mounted down in place, uh, just this Velcro will be plenty to hold this panel in place right over the top of the battery. Uh, but if we need to get under the panel again, let's say to replace a fuse, we just pull it right back up. So Velcro is actually very sturdy, but it's removable, so it's going to be pretty handy for this. So I'll pull these parts out, I'll glue down the battery, I'll add in some Velcro. Uh, now the Velcro is going to have a little bit of thickness. Um, I 
did cut a small wood spacer just to account for the thickness of the terminals on the battery. I'm not sure if I'm going to use this or not. It kind of depends on the thickness of the Velcro. But let's give it a shot, see how it works. The first thing I want to do, of course, is to make sure that the battery is in the right place because once I glue it, I'm not going to be able to move it anymore. And I know the distance from this edge of the box to the edge of the battery. It's the size of my cover here because I want this edge to be flush with the battery. So I can just set it in there and check that. I can also measure across here, and perhaps the simplest way is just to get the battery in the right spot and then mark it. So here I'm just going to use an awl to just score a little line in the plastic to show exactly where it is I want the battery. And then I can uh, go up the sides of the box as well. And I can just mark it going, yep, right there. That's where the battery goes. So I'll use some of my silicone caulk and put a couple of dabs in there. And maybe just spread it around just a little bit. And I'll just let that sit for a while to dry. Next, I cut a piece of the industrial Velcro. I did find that the Velcro wasn't quite thick enough to make up for the spacing that I would need to space out from the spade terminals on the battery. So I would, in fact, end up using that wooden spacer. I just made sure to stick everything together so it was all lined up, and then put some of the silicon glue on the back of the spacer and put the entire thing down on top of the battery. Then once the glue was dried, I'd be able to just uh, separate the Velcro to pull the faceplate right off. So at this point, our ammo can is basically done in terms of having a battery, being able to pull power out of it, run a light, charge a cell phone, uh, do all those handy off-grid and emergency situation type things. Uh, but now let's talk about charging it, and especially since I've been calling this my solar ammo can, let's take a look at a solar panel. This is one I happen to have already had. It's marked as a 15 watt panel. Pretty small, pretty light, pretty portable, which is perfect to go with the system. And we're used to thinking of power in terms of watts. A 60 watt light bulb uses 60 watts. Makes sense, right? But when we're looking at charging, we should really be thinking about current measured in amps. So if I look on the back of this, our current is actually right about one amp. Now voltage is higher, it's right around 18 volts. So if we say 18 volts times one amp, that's about 18 watts. They call it a 15 watt solar panel. Sounds fair, sounds about right. But what we have to keep in mind is that the maximum current this can output is about one amp. So essentially, it's a one amp charger. Now that 18 volts, that's going to be in full sun. If it's a little overcast, it's gonna be a little lower than that. The important thing is that the voltage from the solar panel is higher than the voltage of the battery in the ammo can. And to prevent overcharging of the battery, our solar charge controller is going to use pulse width modulation, PWM, where basically it makes and breaks the circuit between the solar panel and the battery thousands of times per second. And it's as though it's lowering the voltage from 18 volts down to whatever this needs to charge, whether that's about 13, 14 volts in there uh, for actually our charging voltage. But it doesn't change current, so that current is kind of the important thing to remember. So basically, we've got a one amp solar charger, which that's relatively small, uh, but our battery is a 15 amp hour battery. So let's say it was completely empty, 15 amp hours, one amp, it would take 15 hours to charge. But there's a couple of caveats here. For one thing, typically lead acid batteries, we're never gonna run them all the way down. That's a good way to kill lead acid batteries. So let's say we run it halfway down. Uh, that might be uh, seven or eight amp hours. At one amp, that could mean seven or eight hours of charging. I'm planning on using this during the summer where I've got plenty of solar access. Seven or eight hours, that's actually very doable. Now, what if 
a day like today, it's just not sunny or we wanna be prepared ahead of time. We wanna have the battery all charged up. Or maybe let's just say we have uh, grid power, AC power available to us. You will notice that I did not actually add an AC in jack into the system. The only input on here is purely that solar input. But remember, we just need DC power higher than what the, uh, what the battery has. Um, if the battery is at 12 volts, we just need something higher than 12 volts to charge that battery. So instead of plugging an AC cord into this, what we can do is just use any DC power supply that's higher than 12 volts. So this one here is marked as being 18 volts DC, 1.3 amps. This is actually almost identical to our solar panel, except for the fact that this is gonna run off of our wall AC power. So let's say I wanna charge at night, I'm on the grid, all I have to do is plug this into the wall, and then my banana jack ends here, plug those into the solar input on the box. Now, both the solar panel and this power adapter happen to have the banana jack connectors on them, and that's one reason why I use those connectors in the box here. Uh, but the other thing I like about those connectors is the fact that you can use them with bare wires. So you just unscrew them most of the way and there's a spot to stick a bare wire through and then crank it down. Which means uh, you could have an old power supply that was even missing the end on it. Snip, snip, run it right in. It's absolutely perfect. Or let's say you want um, any other kind of a connector. We got this big solar panel back here that uses MC4 connectors. I could certainly have a pigtail, just a short pair of those connectors going to bare wire and run them in to right here. Now, another interesting thing is that the big solar panel behind me, that's really about a 30 volt solar panel. This is 18, so it can put out a much higher voltage, but I really don't need that high of voltage to charge a 12 volt battery. But that'll put out high enough voltage to be able to charge a 24 volt system. So alternatively, uh, I could actually have that solar panel hooked up to this box with two batteries inside connected in series for a 24 volt system. Now, one of the reasons why I'm not doing that is because 12 volt is a standard for so many things, uh, although 12, uh, 24 volt is also commonly used for uh, off-grid solar systems. So right now we can see that our battery has 12.6 volts. And actually, if we turn on our other setup over here, the other voltmeter is saying 12.7, 12 which is interesting because uh, we only have up to a a tenth of a volt accuracy. So if it's something like 12.65, they might read different from each other. But we'll keep our eye on the voltmeters when we start charging. Now it does happen to be a rainy and overcast day, so I'm not gonna use my solar panel to charge. That's not gonna do us any good. But I'm indoors and I have grid power. So here's my extension cord with even the little light shows it's got power. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug in this uh, 18 volt, one amp uh, wall wart power supply. So I'm plugging this into our wall power. And I should have 18 volts coming out here and I'll plug this into our solar in. And when we do that, we should see an indication over here. And I totally screwed up. I plugged it in backwards. You'd think I could just follow the color codes, but since I'm trying to think about the video, shoot the video, and everything else all at one time, I accidentally plugged it in backwards. And of course, polarity matters. Uh, another nice thing that I like with this solar charge controller here is it says full protection over here. It does have some nice features built in, like uh, if you accidentally plug in your, your solar source backwards, you're not gonna wreck anything. So let's try that again. Actually follow the color codes, black to black, red to red. And this time we'll see what happens. Immediately uh, it has an icon over here uh, indicating a solar panel and an arrow going to the battery and it's flashing that's showing that we're charging. Uh, you'll also see that the voltmeter is sort of jumping around a little bit. So our power coming in is trying to raise the voltage of the battery and it's using uh, PWM control. And I think what's happening here is that the frequency at which the pulse width modulation is going on 
um, is kind of uh, interfacing uh, with the frequency of the voltmeter. Uh, up here you can see that volts voltage is kind of jumping around a bit, whereas down on this meter it doesn't. So again, that's another reason why it's kind of nice to have the, the two voltmeters instead of just the one uh, that's built in here. So basically we're charging at one amp and I could just plug this in. Um, I could even leave it plugged in overnight, for example. The charge controller is the charger. Um, the power coming in is literally just power. We do not need a separate uh, battery charger with the system. If we did, we could actually lift up this panel, plug the battery charger right down to the battery itself. Okay, here's some of the things we can do with our solar ammo can. For starters, we have USB light, great for a, a campsite or running for a long time, for example. We could also use that USB to charge up a cell phone, tablet computer, anything along those lines. If we want more light, we could use a 12 volt LED bulb and that'll light up an entire campsite all night, no problem. We also have the ability to run AC power with an inverter for anything that uh, requires AC power. This one's good for up to 100 watts. We also have an auxiliary DC out, and then we can charge the entire system either from wall power or from a solar panel. And all of our accessories fit very nicely right down in the storage compartment. So overall, I'm very happy with how this project turned out. There's still one thing I think I'd like to add. Now, the box is very nondescript. It's a plain black box. Nobody even knows what's inside. If you want to go covert, that's the way to go. On the other hand, I think I want to put my stamp on it. So I'm going to use my vinyl cutter to do a little bit of lettering on here. So I think that about covers it for the solar ammo can. I hope you enjoyed learning about it as much as I enjoyed uh, sharing and uh, putting this together. Uh, I think it's a great little project, handy for camping, emergency preparedness, you name it. It's also just a great little project for learning the basics of electronics. So I hope you enjoyed and until next time, stay charged up.